Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The relationship between the two separate Palestinian entities bordering Israel but not each other has made no real progress over the last 13 years, ever since the Islamist Hamas organization took over Gaza by force of arms and in return was left out of power in the Palestinian Authority ruling the West Bank. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar hold different views of Israel with Abbas believing in negotiations and Sinwar in armed resistance, yet neither seem to advance their declared cause by decisive action. To explore the status of the so-called Palestinian cause between diplomacy and conflict, we're joined from central Israel by Colonel in Reserve Miri Eisen, who is an Israeli public diplomacy, security and intelligence expert at the International Institute for Counterterrorism in Herzliya. Welcome. Shalom. Also joining our panel from another location in central Israel is Colonel in Reserve Grisha Yakubovich, who is a policy and strategy consultant and analyst at Grisha Consulting. Welcome. Hi, welcome. And I'd like also to welcome uh, to today's panel our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and immediately dive into today's topic. Uh, Mr. Oren, what is the so-called cause which we hear about so often, and to what degree does this cause uh, come into the day-to-day -day actions undertaken by the various Palestinian factions? All Palestinians uh, wish to have uh, an independent, sovereign Palestinian state within at least the uh, borders of uh, the 1949-67 armistice lines, but uh, they wish for more. The 1947 partition agreement, or perhaps the entire country uh, between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. They want all the refugees and the descendants, the 1948 refugees, uh, to be repatriated into Palestine. And they want to have uh, Jerusalem as the capital of their uh, state. Where they diverge is uh, on the uh, <coughs> uh, strength of the country, whether it will be demilitarized or not, on uh, the size and on the, the tactics in order to get there. With, as you said, Hamas and the uh, Palestinian Jihadi, um, Islamic Jihad, uh, going for armed struggle, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the PA, and Fatah leader uh, getting by uh, with negotiations. However, uh, in a rare show of agreement, uh, they uh, joined forces uh, earlier this month, on September the 3rd, uh, in a simultaneous broadcast from Beirut and Ramallah, where all of the factions within the Palestinian uh, organizations voiced uh, their disapproval of the agreement between the United uh, Arab Emirates and Israel, because they believe that this is going to bypass the Palestinian cause and leave them uh, alone. They vowed to resist it. The common denominator being uh, the resistance against Israel in different forms. Colonel Eisen, how do you view this uh, current situation? When we look at the Palestinians and at their leadership, the biggest challenge is always how often can they miss an opportunity? But when we say miss an opportunity, we're thinking in our own terms. We're thinking they could have had a state if they'd agreed in 1947 or in 1949, or later on, and they always wanted a Palestinian state instead of Israel. I don't think that they're unified right now either. What Amir just went through, that list of different factions, of different organizations, of different possibilities, those are huge changes and differences within the Palestinian entity, and it isn't that they'll suddenly agree on where they're going to go. To go, they have serious differences. So I would say that right now they are in their regular tragic place. They will only know to disagree and they cannot agree on anything that really brings them closer to a Palestinian state. Colonel Yakubovich, your view on this? Very simple. Uh, the Palestinians missed the train and the train left without them. Uh, they did the, the mistake that they relied on the Arab League and they couldn't uh, actually understand the fear that the Sunni uh, world has from Iran. And this is actually what brought the normalization. Hamas 
uh, as the second part of the Palestinians in Gaza has some uh, tight connections with Iran. So exactly as Miri said, they never, the Palestinians never missed an opportunity that they can miss an opportunity. And they always bet on the wrong horse. Uh, one thing that I want to uh, comment is about what do they want. I think that one of the things that is that normalization with the Arab world provides is uh, a chance to a uh, reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah. But I don't think it will happen because Hamas and Fatah understand this is exactly what Israel wants. So they are in a certain uh, catch-22 uh, in this reality. So I think that we will continue dealing with two Palestinian different entities, one in Gaza, Hamas, a terror organization, and the second one in the West Bank, Fatah, Abu Mazen, and everybody are waiting to see what will be the day after. Indeed. Mr. Oren, what do the Palestinians want? Well, if we go back uh, to the uh, initial involvement of uh, the United States in the Middle East, um, we go back to the uh, meeting between uh, President Roosevelt and King Ibn Saud um, on the... Uh, United States Navy ship Quincy in the Bitter Lake in uh, the Suez Canal in 1945, uh, a short time before Roosevelt uh, died. And at that time, the American president promised the Saudi monarch that the United States uh, will consider uh, Arab claims in the problem of Palestine. And what uh, this, this meant was that in addition to the uh, uh, Arab countries which uh, were in existence at the time, there will be an Arab state in Palestine, no matter what the Jews in Palestine will get. In 1948, uh, Arab states invaded Palestine, ostensibly to help the Palestinians against the Israelis, but actually each wanted to grab a part of Palestine for itself. So the Palestinians were left with no state from 1948 on. And they became victims not only of their own intrigues, but also of the troubles between various Arab states. Up to until 10 years ago or so, the start of the Arab Spring, they were the uh, so-called orphan child of the Arab world. But now there are so many other problems that the Arabs have to contend with the refugees in Syria, Daesh, many other problems. So the Palestinians have to contend for themselves. And if they don't do it, they will still become Israel's problem. Even if they concede, as both uh, Miri and Grisha said, that they have missed all the best opportunities. And even if they give up and say, OK, we have no more claims, they will still be a burden for Israel. Israel doesn't want to incorporate them as full-fledged citizens. For so, the same reason that the Arabs don't want to indeed. incorporate them into their own respective countries. Indeed, and, and uh, where they are refugees, they don't have any rights. They, they cannot vote in Lebanon or in Iraq or in any of the Gulf countries, of course. Uh, the uh, natives uh, rule their own countries. They want to be helped by the Palestinians as workers, but they do not want to give them a share of the pie. So some formula, some compromise must be found, um, and it will have to be territorial in addition to some other parameters. Colonel Eisen? I think that the biggest problem when you ask Jonathan is what they want is that we're asking that question. I'm not here to stand in for the Palestinian, but for a moment, can I be just a little humanistic and say they want to be citizens of an independent country and they're not. And in that sense, they are an exception to most places in the world. There are not a lot of people in the world today who are citizenshipless. Having said that, it's 2020. Palestine is recognized as an independent state with a passport, with travel rights in 138 countries in the world. You know, Israel only has diplomatic ties with 160, well, we're going up to five and six in the next few days, but we don't have diplomatic ties with everybody in the world. So what do they want? 
I think they would like an independent state. But the challenge is that that independent state, as Amir stated, clearly there's something there, were there. It means that they have to compromise. They have to compromise on the territory. They have to compromise on who is within that state. And those compromises come into the heart of their own vision of themselves. And to me, that's why they're a tragedy. They're never going to be able to agree to the compromises that they have to do to be able to achieve their aim. Colonel Yakubovich, uh, when we're talking, though, about uh, self-determination, so to speak, time and again, we see that uh, there is no uh, determination on uh, the way the Palestinian so-called future state or entity should look like. Because on the one hand, we have Hamas uh, and uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who are a lot more affiliated either with the Muslim Brotherhood or other Salafist organizations. And then we have the Palestinian Authority, which is a lot more secular, a lot more uh, determined on maintaining that secular image. And within that, there is uh, a conflict on a regular basis. There are exchanges of fire. There are different uh, incarcerations of uh, the opposing forces. May they be in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank? It happens over and over and over again since uh, before 2006 when Hamas won the election and was then uh, led out of the uh, municipality of Gaza and so on, which turned it into an armed struggle against the Palestinian Authority uh, for fear of losing control of uh, the territory. How do you see this uh, uh, dynamic come into a point where Israel, let alone the Palestinians themselves, can look at it and say, okay, now we're ready for a Palestinian state? Well, uh, I, I, I'm probably going to say something that would not be so popular, but I think that there is also an opportunity in all those big, huge events that are happening, and, and I want to I wanna, I wanna explain that. We are going to continue and face a two- or a three-state solution. It means nothing will change in the West Bank, nothing will change in Gaza, Hamas will uh, keep being strong in Gaza and the PA will keep being strong in the West Bank and they will continue fighting each other. Okay, with ups and downs. It's like a, a hard check. It, it will be with ups and downs. And there are, both sides are fighting on or preparing themselves to the day after. Okay, for example, Hania just completed a huge visit in Lebanon. He visited the refugee camps in Lebanon. Uh, he was considered to be a hero there. He, he felt so comfortable, and suddenly the last foreign ministry, uh, or the, the, the former Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Lebanon, Basile, uh, started to talk, uh, or started, or, or he started to say that it was a bad visit and they shouldn't uh, host him. So, so it's, it's a fight between those two entities, and they are preparing themselves to the day after. Now, where is the opportunity, okay? Uh, all those countries who are declaring about a normalization with Israel, and actually, I think that the pressure is coming from the U.S., uh, preparing everything for the elections in November. But uh, at the end, somebody will have to pay a price, a certain price. And the ones that will pay the price actually will be Israel. Because it was given to Israel, okay, this, th those peace agreements were actually given to Israel by the, by the U.S. government. Bibi Netanyahu is flying to Washington and everything is nice and wonderful. But the government of Israel will have to pay the price. And the price will be a Palestinian state. Now, maybe for the first stage it will be a Palestinian state in the West Bank. Uh, we have a saying, it comes from the Bible of uh, Samson the hero. Uh, I don't know how, it's in, how it is in English, but in Hebrew it's from Me'az uh, Samatok. It means from all those bad things that the Palestinians feel, they will get something very, very good. So actually maybe this normalization will lead that Mahmoud Abbas or whoever will replace him in the future will get a lot of benefits and many of the Palestinian interests will be given uh, during this, this normalization of the price. And it will also be a price for Hamas, in a way, because there is a crisis in Gaza. The crisis is getting worse. Uh, next year, 2.2 million people will be left without a drop of water in Gaza, and somebody will have to solve the problem, as Mr. Oren said. The problem will be an Israeli problem. But normalization will be actually a bridge to a possible solution that will be given by those countries that Israel has a peace treaty with them.
So we are going to continue and facing a three-state solution for the time being, or three entities, Gaza, West Bank, and Israel, with a possible or with an opportunity to solve some of the problems, big problems, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Well, that's a, a quite and an another, optimistic another, approach. Another today. comment that I want to mention. We'll you have to divide between you. the political. Colonel uh, Yakubovich will come back to you. Mr. Owen? Uh, the, uh, the line uh, which uh, Grisha wanted uh, translated is a blessing in disguise. Uh, that out of uh, what now seems like a very negative development uh, might come uh, a positive. Uh, but also at a time when there is so much division within the Palestinian street itself, considering the fact that the Gaza Strip views the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah as the biggest obstacle to its vision? Yes, but the Gaza Strip uh, uh, is still um, endowed with some resources such as the shoreline. The Gaza can have a port, a harbor, which Israel under certain circumstances might grant it, perhaps on an artificial island uh, off the shore. But, um, you know, when we speak about three states rather than two, it's actually an old idea but with Jordan rather than Gaza as the third state. And what Israel couldn't decide years ago was the difference between territory and government. Even when Israelis were ready to withdraw from some or most of the West Bank, they were not willing at the time to give it back to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which could have established a federation or a confederation either with Palestine or with both Palestine and Israel. And this is an idea whose time may come again. This time around with three or four entities, much like the UAE we talk about so much, is a federation of seven former so-called trucial uh, states. Uh, those small sheikdoms in the Persian Gulf who first got their independence from Britain and almost immediately decided to have a federated form of government with defense and foreign affairs under certain authority, but with other semi-independent policies by each entity. This is also a model which could be emulated by Jordan and Israel because they are not going to let Palestine have an independent foreign policy and defense. Colonel Eisen, I'd like to ask you, even though uh, the Arab Palestinians repeatedly say that they want a state, uh, one says that it wants it uh, next to Israel, the other one says that it wants it at the expense of Israel, but uh, they agree on, on forming a state. I look uh, quite uh, uh, realistically towards uh, the, the Palestinian institutions, the various uh, uh, infrastructure that is uh, set up both in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank. I look at uh, the various uh, economic systems that are installed there, and uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not even nearing the capacity of becoming a failed state. Uh, uh, to be able to really emerge from into a, a greener pastures, but rather it is still stagnated in a position where it is heavily reliant, uh, if not almost exclusively on foreign aid. Are they even trying to establish a certain base in order to uh, build a solid foundation to move forward? Or is this all just a game to try and, and maneuver around uh, uh, an existing prob uh, problem that they might uh, already somewhat uh, think that there is no uh, future in the making? It's a fascinating point that you're making. Let's think about the economy for a moment. So I'm going to add in a little bit more data and try and answer your question. The first thing is that in the Gaza Strip specifically, half the population is under the age of 25. They were born after the agreements between Israel and the PLO. They were born after, for them, their entire life, the Palestinian Authority and then the Hamas are the ones that have ruled over their lives. Have they created jobs? Have they created opportunities? And that's part of the background which has everything to do with their own future. And it's intricately connected also to Israel because at the end, the Gaza Strip for the last 
13 years because of Israeli policy has been isolated. And I can support that policy, but boy, does that have an impact on any kind of economic future. When you look at the West Bank, when you look at the West Bankers, and even there, almost half the population is under the age of 25. It's not the same as probably half the population is under the age of 30, but that same kind of challenge. Who creates jobs? Who creates a future? So when we think about that, here again is that opportunity that comes out of the new world. They are relatively educated. They are relatively with the capability to be part of the kind of um, economy that you want to think of Israel with, of a startup nation, but something that would be in Arabic for the hundreds of millions of Arabic speakers. Certainly the United Arab Emirates in the area of the Gulf countries already are interested in having cooperation there. Now, what I just said is the utopian kind of thing. The whole challenge is that that economic aspect, that creating jobs, the idea of creating a future, which is something viable, not under Israel, but within their own independent arena, is not something that has been invested in by them over the last decade. Colonel Yakubovich, uh, I'd like to hear your previous point, which you wanted to make, but at the same time, I'd like also to, uh, to receive your perception is there a reality in which the Palestinian Arabs would become an integral part of the state of Israel in any formality, considering the fact that their institution is just not able to create a state of their own at this stage? It will look like we coordinated ourselves, because that's actually like, like I knew what you were going to ask me with my form of comment. So what I wanted to say is that there's a huge difference between the Policymakers, the government, the Palestinian government, the parliament, you know, the old generation, and between the people and the street. Now, I'm working a lot with the private sector, and I'm meeting a lot of workers, and I have a lot of clients in Gaza and friends. And what I hear is something that is not new, but the old generation or the leadership, they want maybe a two state solution, maybe, I don't know, a new reality, a solution to refugees, et cetera, et cetera. But what the people want, and this is what I hear, they actually they say something like that. We tried to kill you and we failed. We tried to make peace with you and, and we failed. So why don't we go back to 48 and uh, become what we used to be together, a one state solution, Palestine? Uh, I think we talked about it last time, and I hear more and more voices of the young generation, of people between the age of 20 to 30, that uh, they are so disappointed from their government. It's from in Gaza or in the West Bank, it doesn't matter. In the West Bank, they talk freely, fr uh, uh, more freely than, than, than in Gaza. In, in Gaza, they might be arrested or uh, they might be killed. I don't know if you've seen a video last week, uh, a guy that his mother died from COVID-19, and Hamas uh, policemen beaten him to almost to death uh, only because of the fact that he uh, dared to, left, uh, to leave the house. So it's a totally different reality there. But people do talk. Uh, people do criticize the Palesti uh, Hamas, their Palestinian government there. But the new thing is, and I don't know if it's already new because many Palestinians talk about it, is that uh, their Palestinian governments are not capable to lead or to build a Palestinian state. And what they want to do is they want to be or they want to become a one state solution. Personally, if you ask me, this is something that I, as an Israeli Zionist Jew, I will never agree to something like that. OK, and I will never vote a government that will uh, accept such a solution. Uh, but this is something that uh, maybe I don't know, maybe this new reality in the Middle East, uh, it might start coming up and people will start talking about it. Mr. I, I Oren, think, I, I'd like to uh, add something very short because I, I do agree that I myself also hear in the Palestinian street a lot more from the younger generation speaking about a one-state solution or, or some kind of one-state solution under Israeli authority uh, with the, the main person saying something like that, the son of uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas himself, who came out and actually said it uh, publicly, that he would rather see a one uh, entity control the entire territory. Nevertheless, this would mark the end of the, the uh, vision for Jewish state, as if we really start counting the, the population in Israel, in the Gaza Strip, and in the West Bank, the majority or 
uh, almost uh, equal and even a little bit more, is Arab slash Muslim. Well, let me remind Grisha's friends who uh, espouse uh, this idea or uh, uh, hark back to 1948 that there was indeed a one state here, single state, but under the British mandate. And we are not going to uh, lure the British back here under any pretense. They, they uh, have left. It was their first Brexit. They are not uh, coming back. So we have to contend with the Palestinians on our own. And yes, as most everyone here will say, it can be either Jewish or democratic in the long run, because demography will work uh, its clock. And down the road, 20, 40, 60 years from now, there will be an Arab or Muslim majority and a Jewish minority. And if the Arabs can vote for a single coalition, they will rule the country. It is, it is not preordained. Maybe they will fight within themselves. But, and when everyone talks about 1947, the partition um, resolution, what Israel was going to be was a Jewish majority state, but with a very thin majority. Yes, perhaps immigration would have made us uh, a much larger majority. But in the beginning, there was only, um, there were very few thousand uh, people difference between Jews and Arabs in the uh, state of Israel. So this is not an experiment one should try. We should find a compromise between Israel and Palestine. Indeed, a compromise that uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, how those things uh, come along because a political solution uh, uh, obviously is uh, highly preferred over a military one. Uh, as uh, we all experience plenty of wars over the course of 72 years. But this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Colonel Yakubovich, Colonel Eisen, Mr. Owen, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time.